Okay guys, we're going to get ready to start looking at our second installment and looking at the uh, tensions and turmoil over taxation in the colonies. So grab your uh, viewing guide, uh, go ahead and fill that out, pause when you need to, uh, and also write down um, your answer to a few questions I'm going to ask you as we uh, take a look at our screencast. Here are the things you should be able to do. Our essential question, how did tensions grow between Britain and its American colonies? Uh, four things you should be able to do, and this is kind of your notes are structured this way. Describe uh, how Britain uh, tried to ease growing tensions in the American frontier. List ways colonists were taxed and how they rejected this taxation by Parliament. Identify and scribe, uh, describe uh, new colonial leaders. You can use this, uh, again, as you think about your uh, historical short stories and your uh, historical novel, you can uh, think about these new characters uh, who we come across. So let's look at um, how Great Britain tried to eat the tensions on the American frontier. Remember, there's trouble on the frontier. Uh, after the French and Indian War, uh, many settlers start to move past the Appalachian Mountains into the Ohio River Valley. Uh, clashes with Native Americans uh, begin to occur, as you would think. Uh, some of these uh, groups were the Seneca uh, in Delaware, the Suwannee, uh, the Ottawa, uh, the Miami, and the Huron. We were familiar with them. This was the group that helped support the French during the French and Indian War. And so Lord Amherst, uh, because he's uh, the leader of the British Army, if you remember from the French and Indian War, uh, he's sent to keep order. And so a couple of things uh, take place as they start uh, colonists move toward the American frontier. Uh, they're setting up these trading posts. Uh, Lord Amherst is uh, uh, is instituting new taxes on these uh, trading posts, and so prices are going up. Um, they also the settlers are building farms and forts. Um, however, um, they're not having the uh, fluidity or the ability to do it um, as they desire. Um, Amherst and, and the other British uh, are instructing how this is taking place. Um, in the process, they encounter Native Americans. Uh, take a look at this quote here, and I want you to pause the video for a few moments and uh, read it, and then write down what do you think it's trying to say. All right, now that you had a chance to uh, think about what this has to say, this quote is from an Ottawa, uh, Ottawa chief uh, named Pontiac. Uh, he led multiple raids against uh, the colonists who were moving beyond the Appalachian Mountains into the Ottawa uh, territory. Uh, he felt that the uh, colonists were robbing them um, of all of their traditions. Um, they were taking off of the livestock that they hunted and lived off of for centuries. And so this became um, very violent uh, to the point where the British were uncertain if it was a good idea to actually try to settle this uh, frontier. And so what they did was institute uh, something called the Proclamation of 1763. This particular uh, proclamation did not allow uh, the settlers to move past the Appalachian Mountains. And so uh, e even though uh, they had already moved out there, um, the colonists who were there, the British said, had to return back to uh, the settlements uh, beyond the Appalachian to the east. And so this really infuriated the colonists. Uh, again, they were upset. They had fought during the French and Indian War so that they could expand and move out here. And because of the uh, inability to stop the warfare between the Native Americans, the British felt that they needed to uh, stop individuals from moving beyond here uh, to the point where they sent nearly 10,000 troops to try and enforce this. Um, but colonists continued to um, overlook this. Daniel Boone is one uh, said person who actually um, pushed beyond, fought back against this proclamation line uh, that was instituted by the British. So let's look at ways the colonists were taxed and then let's look at how they rejected taxation from Parliament. As you remember, uh, French and Indian War uh, was very costly. It put Great Britain into debt and so what other way uh, to make up for that was to tax the colonists. By, by the way, the reason why we fight in this war is so that we uh, can protect you uh, and give you the uh, ability to actually uh, expand. So why not? The colonists should be happy to be taxed. And so uh, some of the taxes that they instituted was a sugar act, the sugar act, which um, uh, lowered the tax uh, on sugar. Uh, the Stamp Act, uh, it placed new duties on legal documents such as wills, diplomas, marriage papers. Um, also taxed newspapers, playing cards. Think about it. Everything um, that was a part of everyday life 
basically was taxed through the Stamp Act. And so colonists uh, move out west, they encounter Native Americans, Pontiac's War breaks out, um, then the Proclamation of 1763 is placed because, again, the British don't want to uh, have to defend the colonists. Uh, they start to in, in, interact these, uh, enact these, uh, these taxes, the Sugar Act, Stamp Act, or just a few, uh, start to put a burden on the colonists. Um, and we see that the colonists are going to start to push back. So let's take a look uh, at the pushback. One of the ways in which uh, the colonists uh, pushed back against the collecting of the taxes was a lot of the uh, tax collectors who would come around, the British uh, tax collector agents, they would be tarred and feathered. Here you can see a picture of uh, this. We will take a look closer in class and, and discuss and talk about it a little bit more. Uh, this shocked the British, all right? And so they wanted to know why would the colonists be responding this way? And so go ahead and pause the video and in your own words, explain why you think the colonists might uh, be going to lengths as far as tar and feather uh, tax co uh, collectors, et cetera. All right. Um, this phrase you may have heard before, uh, no taxation without representation, um, one of the battle cries uh, of the American colonists. They insisted that only those who they elected or representatives from their particular town or particular colony could actually set laws to do that, not um, parliament, because the, the colonists had no representation over in Europe in parliament. And so um, they started uniting together uh, in peaceful protest. Um, they, again, the uh, advent of newspapers was another vehicle and avenue they used to do that. Um, the Stamp Act Congress uh, drew up a petition um, that uh, they wrote to King George III in response to these taxes. Um, so they wanted to uh, share their discontent uh, with what was going on. And then many colonists boycotted or refused to use British goods. Um, so again, remember with the triangle trade, um, what would happen is that goods that were um, created or manufactured in Europe would be bought to the Americas and they would purchase those items from the British. They refused to buy those items and they boycotted. So okay. let's look in the process of, as we look at this new move toward protest in the colonies at some new key leaders uh, who began to emerge. So uh, you had the Townshend Act instituted. This was a tax on goods such as glass, paper, paint, lead, and tea. Uh, you also had something that the British were instituting uh, because they didn't like the protests that were going on, known as writs of assistance. And this is where we kind of give our idea of, of a, a no illegal search or seizure. And so what they would do is if there was any dissent amongst the uh, colonists, they would send in uh, British troops uh, to break it up or to uh, search the property to see if uh, they had things that were speaking out, uh, any items that were speaking out, pamphlets such, uh, such as that, meeting times, trying to figure out, and they would uh, arrest those individuals who, who was involved in speaking against the British. Many uh, of the, the British, uh, excuse me, the colonists felt that this violated their rights as citizens, that they were a part of, of Great Britain, and so therefore they should not uh, be, uh, their property should not be searched illegally. And so this started to uh, separate the idea that the colonists are not actually part of Great Britain. And so uh, individuals known as the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty, um, they led protests, they organized, they, had, they held meetings within the towns. And so uh, I'm going to show you a quick little video introducing you and getting you an idea of, of some of those new characters. So write those down. Um, as you listen uh, to the video. Uh, I think the Sons of Liberty are definitely um, soldiers of opportunity. They wanted freedom, they wanted an existence of their own. I think we were a match that lit a fire and um, exposed the rest of the colonies to the tyranny of the Crown and Parliament at the time. This will not happen to anyone in Boston ever again. We need more guns. If you're going on a revolution, you want Sam Adams on your right shoulder. He approaches things from a very straightforward, physical point of view, which is different from John Adams and Earl Hancock, and maybe Franklin also would like to approach getting to the end post. Sam is our leader. He gives the speeches that get 
to your marrow and get you excited about what we're doing. But he's also a leader from the front as opposed to a leader from the back. It is my pleasure to welcome you all. I think John Hancock has the biggest character arc in terms of him being in a different place at the end than what it was at the beginning. He took my house. Of course he did. He becomes more than a man simply trying to get his possessions and his power back. We see him waking up to this extraordinary moment in history that he's absolutely involved in. Gage has the British Empire. An endless supply of weapons, trained soldiers, a navy. We need a better plan. I think John Adams is always sympathetic to the cause. It's just he's a man who's ruled by law. He was a leading man in his community, and people respected his opinions. John, this, this is hopeless. These men are cowards. They are, are... We need these men. We have to find another way of convincing them. John Adams was sort of the voice of reason. There was a visceral emotional attachment to the cause where he was able to step back and see the entire chessboard. So he was a good guide in terms of using the passion we're able to generate and directing it into something purposeful. Mr. Revere, I am John Hancock, and I would like to thank you for letting us use your workshop. Ah, of what you're paying for, you could have the place. Revere saw himself both as an artisan as well as a gentleman, which was a new idea uh, on class. He very much was an intelligence operator, and he could maneuver and operate amongst these different groups of people. This was a group of ordinary guys in all respects. We think of them as these mythological beings, but they were these guys that got together and ended up moving mountains, really. All right, let's finish up uh, looking at one of the most... Uh, impactful event when we look at the American uh, Revolution, uh, the Boston Massacre. So Boston and New York were centers of protest uh, and often you saw in these particular areas uh, in uh, the Quartering Act, this is where the uh, colonists had to house uh, so British soldiers um, as they were over here. So not only house them but provide for them uh, to feed them um, and this was at a great expense to themselves. And so. Uh, March 5th, 1770, uh, colonists gathered to protest uh, outside a customs house, and in the ruckus, uh, shots were fired, and this became known as the Boston Massacre. We're going to analyze it and, and discuss whether or not this was an actual massacre, um, but it was um, touted as a massacre and really um, sparked a uh, great uh, movement and protest and organization amongst the American uh, colonists. Uh, most of the Township Acts after the Boston Massacre was repealed. Um, again, this was an attempt for the, uh, the British to try and appease and settle tensions amongst the uh, colonists. Uh, but it did not last very long. Um, taxation was one of the biggest issues that brought the colonists against the British. We'll wrap up uh, here. Uh, we'll take a look at an overview uh, in class. I'll post this on Moodle for you. Uh, Write down any questions you may have, and I look forward to discussion.